Okay, thank you everyone uh, for taking time today to attend this webinar um, called Point of Care Testing to Care, Testing to Care, Monitor and Protect. Uh, my name is Julie Hart uh, and I'm your chair for today. I previously worked in the diagnostics industry, um, but for the last 10 years I've been working in the NHS uh, and academia, evaluating innovative diagnostic technologies uh, and transforming NHS care pathways. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping for today is that um, you can type your questions uh, throughout this session uh, and you can do that by clicking on the little question mark icon which you should see either at the top uh, or in my case at the side of my window. Uh, we'll also be running a poll um, which you can access by using the little bar chart icon and uh, to apply for your CPD points, you need to click on the little uh, gift or offer icon. Um, you can all find those on the sidebar. I'm just going to set the scene a little for today uh, and talk a, a little bit about my experiences um, of introducing point of care testing. Uh, and we've introduced point of care testing either as a decision support or a diagnostic tool in care pathways. Um, to monitor and protect patients um, and we found that successful implementation and adoption comes from a needs-driven approach. Um, so we've seen successes where there is a clear focus on having uh, on solving the unmet clinical need uh, as opposed to being driven completely by the technologies themselves. So for, for my colleagues in the NHS out there you need to clearly identify what is the problem being solved. So, for example, today I'm a paramedic uh, and I want to use point of care testing to inform my decision as to whether a patient needs to go to hospital or whether they can be safety, safely managed in the community. So this is the type of thinking we've been, uh, we've been working to, on to identify those unmet needs. And importantly, when introducing point of care testing, particularly into community settings, um, there's additional challenges. There needs to be a strong collaboration between pathology laboratories in secondary care and community providers, whether they're, that's GPs, paramedics, pharmacies, respiratory hubs, uh, community diagnostic centres and the local ICS. Um, and when introducing um, point of care testing or testing nearer to the patient, um, we always need to ensure um, whether, that the uh, point of care testing result is equivalent to a lab quality result. And it's, that's why it's really important that we involve pathology colleagues in the implementation as they're as vital as they're responsible in, for ensuring the tests have undergone local validation and are part of an ongoing quality control programme. Another factor that's often overlooked, and we'll be hearing about one solution later today, is that digital integration is also key so that patient res results can be uploaded into the electronic patient record. Uh, whether you're using a test reader or transferring results by uh, software, which is available called middleware to the EPR, um, data and connectivity is important. Uh, and we recognise that it's currently much more advanced and understood in secondary care than in community settings. So I've, I've been involved in a number of uh, point of care uh, evaluations and implementation projects. Um, and I'll just give you an example of one of them, um, which is directly relevant to today's um, presentation. So we had an ED consultant uh, and the problem that came to us is that the ED consultant says, I see too many avoidable admissions of over 65s with suspected influenza. The annual chief medical officer letter has just come out um, outlining approval for the use of antivirals in the community. So how could we test and treat influenza in the community, therefore avoiding patients coming, having to come to the hospital? And during a horizon scanning exercise, we found there are several point of care tests that are available. But when we went to the pathology lead, they informed us that multiple laboratories have already conducted laboratory verification testing. And in fact, one test was already being used and validated in the hospital's microbiology laboratory. So we instigated a quality improvement project involving all key stakeholders to implement point of care testing in the community and connect those results back for the, the EPR. 
So what happens when you've actually successfully implemented uh, a point of care test? Is that it? Do you stop there? And the simple answer we find is no. We've got to also measure the impact of that test through a pathway service evaluation. So for three months, we measured the number of people who were tested, the number of people tested positive for flu, the number of people who prescribed antivirals, how many admissions were avoided, how many ICU admissions were avoided, and how many deaths prevented. And this is really vital information because we need to develop business cases to drive future adoption implementation. Otherwise, some of these um, projects become another example of a great service evaluation, but then there's no adoption into routine care. And to run a successful real world evaluation or indeed implement a solution that's already been proven, I must emphasize that it's vital to get all those stakeholders around the table at the same time. The pathology lead, the clinical lead, the community provider if applicable, the local ICS stakeholder, your IT department, all these people need to come to work together to address the clinical need and implement the point of care testing solution. Point of care testing um, can also help to reduce health inequalities, but also to contribute towards our net zero targets, where patients don't have to travel as far or as often to get a simple blood test, for example. The COVID pandemic has shown the value of using diagnostics and particularly point of care diagnostics. And I strongly believe this momentum shouldn't be lost. We should capitalize on the learnings from the pandemic. We also evaluated tests robustly during that time, but also equiply and efficiently. And this momentum needs to be maintained, not lost. We also need to see more successful models widely adopted and implemented across the UK. And thank you very much. That's <coughs> sorry. And I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Jude George Newham is the research and development manager at Short Screen Diagnostics. Dr. Newham has a PhD in molecular and nanoscale physics with research interests including novel nanoparticle synthesis, formulation science, drug delivery in vitro diagnostics, and now specialise in rapid point of care testing and lateral flow testing. Our second speaker is Dr. Rahul Batra, who is the Clinical Innovations and Disruptive Technologies Lead in the Centre for Clinical Infection and Diagnostics Research at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. Dr. Batra completed his clinical training at the University of Southern California prior to joining Guy's and St. Thomas's. His areas of research include hospital-acquired infection transmission, next-generation sequencing, medtech diagnostic development and implementation of rapid diagnostics. Dr. Andrew Botham is Chief Scientific Officer at TestCard. Andrew previously worked for the pharmaceutical company Pfizer in academic research, has headed up research and development for private pathology networks and in the NHS, leading in innovation practice for pathology across multiple hospital sites. Andrew started TestCard in 2017 whilst working in his NHS role, now works full time for TestCard as his chief scientific officer and is our final speaker. So I'd like to hand over now to Dr. George Newham to, do, to make the first presentation. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Julie. Fantastic. Um, and of course, I second the sentiment. Thank you all for coming uh, and, and yeah, welcome to be here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a physicist by trade, uh, so I'm probably going to speak to you more about the science side today. And obviously, we're all intimately familiar with lateral flow testing and, and the swabbing and, and how to use the test and where this test line comes from. But maybe we don't actually know so much about what's happening inside the test and how that leads to a positive or a negative result. So how can you really interpret your result with confidence without understanding a bit of background? The intention here as well is that this will provide some useful context for, for Andrew and Rahul's talks later on. Um, so next slide, please, when you're ready. Perfect, there we are. So we'll start off with some uh, discussion of gold conjugate. This is probably the most important part of a lateral flow test. So there are yeah two main parts that we can consider in a lateral flow test. The first being this gold nanoparticle or gold conjugate. We have very small spheres of gold that are in the ballpark of a thousand times smaller than a, than a human cell. And these have a really dense red color when we view them in solution. 
And to these, we'll attach some antibody or a capture mechanism that will bind onto a specific biomolecule. So in the case of COVID-19, these gold particles and antibodies will specifically attach to the nucleocapsid protein uh, of the virus. Obviously, in other cases, we'll be choosing specific antibodies that will capture only uh, the specific analyte of interest. Next slide, please. The second uh, key part of the test is the test line. So what we're seeing here is a cross-sectional view of the nitrocellulose membrane. So this is a really highly porous paper that the, the test strip itself is, is physically made of. So this pore structure allows for wicking and diffusion of analytes and liquids through the test. So that's the lateral flow element, element. But we can also then impregnate this strip with a really high density of antibodies, which are complementary to the antibody that's attached to our gold nanoparticle. So here, these will also bind to the other side of our nucleocapsid protein in the context of COVID or a second binding site on whatever our analyte of choice is. So to give you a quick eye into what we do on the day to day in terms of research and, and manufacture, we need to be incredibly certain that the porosity of our membranes, for example, these pores don't increase or decrease in size from batch to batch. That will increase or decrease, for example, wicking speed and flow of liquids and also will affect the amount of antibodies that we can fit in, which again will induce either false positives or negatives. So we take extensive steps here to validate both the antibodies we choose and the quality of this nitrocellulose membrane. Next slide, please. So when this is put together onto the, the test strip, I'm sure you've all seen something similar to this before. Now, there appears to be a, a small issue with the graphic, but we have the sample is added to a sample pad and then this conjugate pad is pre-treated with uh, the gold nanoparticles. And then these will together flow across the strip. Next slide, please. So what's happening at area one in the slide is we have our gold nanoparticle and detection antibody. And those, when they contact the sample buffer that the patient has added, will complex with our analytes. So in this case, this would be the, the COVID protein. Um, there appears to be some concern with our graphic in the bottom left, but this would depict the, uh, the gold and these uh, antibody complexes flowing across the strip. When we reach the test line, then we have our analytes attached to the gold, and these are then captured by the antibody I mentioned before, which is impregnated into the nitrocellulose membrane. So we have this chain effect where we've got gold antibody analyte in the middle in red, and then antibody and test line at the bottom. So we can consider the analyte that we've detected is sandwiched in the middle between our gold and test line. So we call this a, a sandwich type assay. Um, and it's the buildup of this gold at the test line, which is occurring you know, uh, on thousands and thousands of binding events at the test line, which causes that visible dense red color because the gold itself is inherently uh, a dense red, dense red color. Um, so to produce our control line, we have exactly the same thing, but we're detecting um, an, an abundant biomolecule or, or protein, for example, immunoglobin G. And we're doing this with uh, the same setup, but a different choice of, of antibodies. Next slide, please. So there's a second and possibly less common type of, uh, of, of assay called a competition assay. And we use this when the analyte that we want to detect is too small to have two antibodies binding to it. So when there is only one possible binding site. And the way this works is at our test line, instead of having uh, a second antibody, we have an immobilized form of the analyte. And this immobilized form of the analyte and the analyte that's in solution will compete to bind with the gold nanoparticle. So in this case, for a positive sample, where all of the binding sites on the gold are occupied, there is no adhesion of the gold at the test line, and we don't see the red line appearing. Whereas for a negative sample, the gold particle with antibodies may bind directly to the test line via this immobilized uh, molecule that we've put on there. So in this case, actually, the uh, positive negative test line response is the, the other way around to what we'd see with, with a standard sandwich type assay. And we do this particularly um, with drugs of abuse testing, for example, where, again, the, the molecules or the metabolites we're looking for are too small to house two binding sites. Next slide, please. 
So it's clear actually that lateral flow tests uh, are not just for COVID at all. And we can actually use a variety of different antibodies for different targets. We've got different testing types even within lateral flow. We can fit multiple test lines uh, for multiple targets even onto the same strip. Or equally, we can have dual or even uh, triple cassettes that will have different strips in them for different satellites as well. We're not limited to antibodies. There are other options. And also, we're not limited simply to nasal swabs or throat swabs. Um, we can use a, a wide variety of, uh, of biological fluids or environmental fluids as well. Next slide, please. So up to this point, you might be thinking, incredible new tech, um, but maybe we're a bit wary of, of new ideas that might be perceived to be in their infancy. But actually, uh, it was in the early 50s that we first saw lateral flow tests or the concept of a lateral flow appearing in, uh, in academic literature. This developed over the next few decades to become more like the tests we see today. And then the first commercially available pregnancy test appeared in the early 90s. Uh, I think it's fair to say following on from that, there was a uh, maybe a, a burst of new tests appearing onto the scene. And with that, uh, the WHO and other bodies stepped in to provide some perhaps needed guidance and advice on, uh, on, on test performance. And this led us up into the 20s where we saw the first uh, UK approved COVID lateral flow test. Next slide, please. Either way, over this time, we've seen a really large increase uh, in the, the number of published papers and also the breadth and width of topics that these papers are covering. Here we go. Um, if you skip to the next slide as well, please. We can see that actually, yes, it is about uh, COVID testing, for example, but it's also a much wider phenomenon covering a real range of topics um, in academic literature and then in, in the real world now. So. The idea that lateral flow tests are, you know, this fantastic new tool that's come to the environment is partially correct. They really are fantastic, but they're they're not that novel. So we can really trust in the, in the technology that's been developed over the last 70 years or so. Next slide, please. I think this leads us very conveniently to discuss sensitivity and, and specificity quickly and accuracy. So we'll use um, COVID again as, as the model case here. Uh, and the, the most obvious comparison, of course, is to molecular testing, to PCR, which has a, a truly exceptional uh, limit of detection, which I think we all know uh, the standard lateral flow test won't stand up to. Um, and this is part of the trade-off, I think, for the, the portability, the accessibility um, of lateral flow testing. So really, this leads us to a point where when you get a negative result on a lateral flow, we need to consider what that means in the wider context of, of, uh, of the situation. So it doesn't necessarily mean there is no disease. It just means that we're below the limit of detection for this specific test. As it transpires, obviously, I'm sure you're all aware that, that even in asymptomatic patients, the viral load with COVID was, was sufficiently high. Um, when we work then at or above these limits of detection, we have this independently verified uh, time and time again that the specificity and the sensitivity are actually very high. Um, if we're going to, to put a really fine point on it, do they compare to um, really cutting edge, incredibly expensive laboratory tests? Not quite, but given the other extreme positives of lateral flow testing around uh, availability, ease of use, um, the ability to do this at the point of care and cost as well, they really do have a very clear, uh, clear position in the market. Next slide, please. Brilliant. So where do we think lateral flow tests are going from here and what can you expect? Some of these are already happening. Some of these will be here next year, maybe five years, 10 years, and some of them may never come through. But this is what we think uh, the, the future looks like. Of course, we're going to see novel target diseases. We may well see some, uh, you know, integrated um, DNA or RNA amplification. We'll see an expansion of these reporter particles. So at the moment, it's mainly gold nanoparticles that we're using. Um, but there are many other options that may increase sensitivity and performance. We'll also see the introduction of other capture mechanisms. But most importantly, I think, to, to preface what's going to come in, uh, in Rahul and Andrew's talks, We've seen recently the rise of digital readers, and this is something that will continue to grow, I think, uh, appreciably in the, the really immediate future. Next slide, please. So historically, um, 
digital readers were limited to fluorescence readers where you'd have uh, a specific lateral flow test to use that instead of having a gold particle would have a fluorescent molecule. Um, sorry, I'm not seeing the next slide yet. It should come through soon. Here we go, perfect. Um, so instead of seeing at the test and control line, instead of seeing a, uh, a red line appearing, we'd have some fluorescent molecule which physically emits light. So that would then go into a specific reader um, which would give you, in some cases, a quantitative result, but certainly qualitative, and would remove the uncertainty in result interpretation. But of course, this requires a specific reader, which one wouldn't necessarily have in, in every doctor's office, in every point of care setting um, as well. And this also isn't available for many tests. And realistically, it didn't quite take off. So if we proceed to the next slide, we'll see what's coming through now. Um, really excitingly provided by, by uh, you know, se several providers, but most notably TestCard, is the use of app-based digital readers. So here we're using a standard lateral flow test that has the gold particles, as I've, as I've described over the last few minutes, um, but you'll take a picture with the smartphone and interpret the result that way. So we remove uncertainty in the interpretation. Um, as you'll hear soon, there are potential links to digital databases usable by a, by a lay person. Um, and this really, I think, is one of the most notable advances that will come in the near future and hopefully serves as a good segue to, to pass over now um, to the next speakers. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So I think I will go ahead and take over from here. Thanks for the uh, great introduction to the science of lateral flow. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is our experience of uh, implementation of not only lateral flow, but uh, digital reading and integration into our electronic health record of uh, lateral flow testing uh, during the pandemic and um, into the future. Uh, next slide, please. So digital transformation in the NHS has truly been historically a, a challenging process. And with that in mind, improving digital services was at the heart of the NHS long-term plan in 2019, which had set out a target that all trusts should reach a core level of digitalization by 2024. The plan also set out some aspirational goals of digital first primary care with online GP consultations and patient access to their care record through the NHS app by 2023-24. And some of these things seemed really aspirational. Um, we had done none of this uh, prior to the long-term plan, and then the pandemic hit. And with this being the first pandemic of the digital age, instead of retreating from these goals, what we actually experienced was rapid adoption of digital technology in the NHS and a significant change in the way services were delivered. Almost overnight, the NHS adapted to deliver online appointments, remote monitoring, and patient self-management solutions. And since then, millions of people have used these digital tools to get consultations, testing appointments, as well as test results. These digital health tools were integral in being able to keep services running and have really changed the way individuals interact with the healthcare system now. For example, it's clear that digital integration with diagnostics tools will now be standard, giving individuals more power over their own health decisions and strengthening data-driven decision-making for frontline healthcare staff. Given how important this digital transformation has been, I wanted to take this opportunity to describe the journey that we went on with our digital partners in bringing novel testing solutions to GSTT during the COVID pandemic and the lasting effect it's had on our adoption of new technology today. Uh, next slide, please. So if you can all remember back to the, uh, the dark days of the pandemic uh, in the first wave, many individual NHS workers felt they were personally at the center of the pandemic. And here at St. Thomas's, we had good grounds for thinking that this, that we were at the center also, as it was hard to ignore the hospital's symbolic location across from the Houses of Parliament. And also as a, a airborne high consequences infectious diseases lead center, we admitted some of the first COVID-19 cases and we had the honor of treating the largest number of mechanically ventilated patients of any UK institution. Uh, next slide, please. 
So by March 2020, there are more cases being diagnosed here at GSTT than we had uh, HCID beds for, and it became abundantly clear that the status quo wasn't going to hold for very long. What also became clear at the time was our ability to test patients and our access to molecular-based testing was very limited. Not only were the number of inpatient tests we could conduct were limited, but the time to receive a result was going to be a major bottleneck in our patient pathways. The turnaround time for some of these laboratory PCR assays was often between 12 and 72 hours when logistics and batching were taken into account. This meant that there could not inform triage and isolation decisions through the early admission patient admission pathways, and this was particularly problematic at times of peak attendance when clinically suspected patients should have been ideally nursed in single rooms while awaiting for PCR results. But this would have led to the capacity of these rooms being quickly exceeded. Secondly, due to testing constraints, clinically unsuspected COVID cases were also not immediately tested and were nursed in open bays. If they were su subsequently diagnosed to be positive, they became major foci for nosocomial transmission in the hospital. We recognized early that lateral flow testing possibly offered us a solution to the testing constraints that we were facing. And luckily for us, we were able to collaborate with SureScreen who were a UK-based manufacturer, and we were able to co-develop, validate, and test both an antibody test and an antigen test. And we were able to deploy our antigen antibody testing in July of 2020, and by the time the alpha variant struck in December of 2020, we were ready with a hospital-wide deployment of a lateral flow antigen test that led to universal testing in A&E over that Christmas period. Next slide, please. So the first thing that the first issue that we really came up with is that that age old problem of how do you make an analog test digital? And while we we're able to deploy the uh, lateral flow tests across many areas of GSTT, we didn't have the, a robust mechanism to reliably govern the procedure and report results. So we were able to develop a, a manual workaround for this by using glucometers to manually update results to the patient record. Um, but this manual process provided very limited quality assurance. We couldn't review the results once they were, or verify any discrepant results once they occurred. We had to register visitors to the hospital as patients and enter them onto wait lists uh, to enter their results. And we needed extra admin support uh, to do this manual process. In order for the lateral flow testing to replace PCR testing equivalently, robust data capture would have been required. And that could have only been realistically achieved through the use of a complete digital reading solution. Next slide, please. Oh. We were lucky in the fact that we were able to partner with uh, ClearScreen Test Card, and Andrew, who is our next speaker, is the uh, scientific lead. And with this solution, the digital reader that they developed used an image processing capability of a standard mobile phone to scan the cartridge and automatically report the patient ID, cartridge ID, and provide consistent result interpretation. And we were able to deploy this digital solution um, so that it provided and performed to a consistent and high standard. It was easily deployable across all of our hospital system with very little additional infrastructure requirements. And it was a system that could adapt to meet any legal or clinical reporting requirements. So again, that tying it back to high quality uh, pathology needs. And it was also able to provide sufficient real-time data that could be appraised as part of any internal audit or external review. And uh, we were also able to build a robust uh, LFD workflow, which supported improved patient flow and multiple, multiple operational cost efficiencies with the reader. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to walk you quickly through how easy the workflow was and how it integrated into our uh, electronic patient record, which has always been 
one of the most difficult uh, portions of using uh, the a lateral flow tests in, in secondary care. So the app is on a standard uh, uh, um, phone. You can use any phone or you could use your organization's phone. You, you basically uh, authenticate it using a one-time QR token. You, we would log in with our personal logins that we did for other point of care testing, uh, scan or enter the patient ID, run the test flow. The test result only would go into the cloud. Uh, no patient information except for a hospital number was transferred. And that would then return with the result and it would then be sent to our uh, electronic health record where it was immediately available for all frontline staff to see. We also had a, a, a back-end web portal that was accessible where every test was recorded, so you could go back and review results if necessary. Uh, next slide, please. We did develop this workflow for uh, non-professional and professional use. Uh, most of our use was professional use, and so now as we've moved on, we've developed, we have more to, uh, a full uh, test library and the workflow gives you some scanning tips a timer you, it lines the test for you on on the cassette and then it provides the result which you then do a visual confirmation and it's sent directly to the uh to the patient record next slide please so using the digital reader along with the lateral flow, it did address a lot of the drawbacks that uh, point of care and specifically uh, lateral flow uh, diagnostics had in that um, a professional could provide the, the test and the app would support that professional uh, to perform the test correctly every time and support the result. And those results were, are available very quickly allowing patients to be cohorted immediately without uh, excessive side room usage and allowing patients then to move quickly and safely through the hospital. And the results were always available in EPR. And so there was, we were able to cut down on our, uh, on our uh, repeat testing as patients moved um, throughout the hospital. The professional flow uh, and the digital reader also allowed then for senior staff to review the images of the test, and this, uh, these results were uh, reported automatically to Public Health England. Uh, next slide, please. So on review of what we did during COVID, what we actually saw was that we saw in ED, we saw a significant reduction in overcrowding. We saw a decreased need for side room use. Our testing in increased to almost universal testing in ED and allowed for faster triage and better infection control. Um, we were able to record more tests using uh, the digital reader. So our test recording went from about 15% to over 98%. And that improved the visibility of patient status and eliminated a lot of retesting that was going on between the emergency department and the wards. We are also able to capture appropriately the lot and expiry date, and that is a, a, a legal requirement for uh, the for point of care tests. And our inputting errors decreased. So when we compared the data that we had from our manually inputted uh, test results through the glucometers and through the digital solution, we saw a decrease to only two percent. Uh, we were about eight or nine percent with the uh, the manual entry, which is usually expected in, res in uh, errors of uh, transcription. Next slide, please. So through COVID, we started off with the uh, COVID lateral flow. Uh, in 2021-22, we moved on to develop uh, and deploy a COVID and, and flu test, which is now the backbone of our test testing in a &E for symptomatic patients. And we've also now gone on to start to implement and uh, in other areas of the hospital, uh, lateral flow pregnancy tests. And we, during the strep A 
uh, outbreak last year, we were also able to use uh, a digital captured strep A test and we have RSV in development. Uh, so we've taken our learnings that we had uh, from the COVID pandemic and extended our uh, repertoire of testing out. And we do feel that this will become uh, part of our digital future. Next slide, please. So just in conclusion, um, our experience of COVID-19 uh, and a lot of people in the NHS's experience has been that NHS services can radically be redesigned in a short space of time. And in a lot of ways, digital technology has enabled the changes we've seen to occur. And this really shows what can happen when technology addresses a clear problem and people are provided with the space and support to be innovative. It's unsurprising that being able to bottle this type of collaboration, pace, and innovation has been so positive to the NHS so far and to us personally at, at GSTT. And to ensure rapid advancements we've seen are turned into meaningful change in the NHS, we must also address the underlying challenges that have faced the NHS regarding digitalization, such as providing the ad adequate infrastructure and investment to embed these type of technologies and innovation. So I hope that uh, from our example, you can take away some learnings about how important digitalization can be and the impact of lateral flow testing. Thank you very much. So we can go on to the next slide, please. So as we've already discussed, rapid diagnostics are incredibly powerful tools, they're extremely useful. Uh, the problem is that up until now, it's been a case of uh, they get sent out into the world and then it's something of the Wild West. Uh, we don't really know how they're used. We don't know how they're performed. We don't know what their performance is. So SureScreen, for example, as a manufacturer, will spend a lot of time optimizing this test and improving the performance and aligning it as best as possible with the gold standard measurements. And they will be able to tell you what the sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, precision of that test is on the bench, in a laboratory, in perfect lighting conditions, read by a person that's got nothing else to do other than do that test that day. Unfortunately, that's not the reality of the delivery of these tests into clinical settings. So there's a huge iceberg effect of sending these out in the world and knowing, not knowing what they're going to do. Now, up to now, um, well, certainly pre-COVID, the risk to benefit ratio of delivering these was, was skewed in the direction of trying to control as much of this testing within the laboratory in a way that we know where it's being done correctly as possible. And COVID sort of highlighted to people for the first time really that it's not always appropriate to be dragging people into clinical settings or to be doing everything centrally because it, it reduces the ability to move nimbly or moving at pace to be able to treat patients and to be able to move them through the hospital in a, in a, in a, in a way that's going to be for their best benefit and the benefit of the clinical users. So in response to this, who produced this target product profile, that QR links out to it. Um, as a manufacturer of medical tests, we have to read this. Uh, I suggest you take me up on this and don't necessarily read it yourself. It's a very useful document though, as a manufacturer, because it outlines a number of different target product profile points. So across the entire document are 39 points. And now these cover multiple different areas. It isn't just about the performance of the test. It does include performance requirements, but it also includes elements around training requirements, connectivity, uh, language support, power requirements, even the size of the readers that's taking place and, and the overall pricing to make it actually adoptable within care settings. And in most cases, they have both a minimum and optimum guidance. Now the, um, the device that was uh, deployed into GSTT meets every single one of those except one, which is, if we go to the next slide, uh, we don't meet this particular target product uh, profile point because it says that it needs to be able to be hosted on the phone. Now, the reason we actively chose to have a very light footprint on the device in the clinical setting, rather than um, it being all on the phone, was because deployment within ED and within uh, remote clinical settings makes it a risk for data security, uh, for 
health data. If you're storing patient information on a device, which you'd have to do if you weren't actually requiring connectivity, then if someone picks up that device and walks out, they are walking out with patient data. Equally, our solution only uses a unidirectional interface, so it just pushes information up to the web. It doesn't pull. So even if someone stole a mobile phone, because you know they are by design incredibly portable pieces of equipment, um, and they walked out with it from the emergency department, they can neither access existing records of testing that's taken on there or actually access any part of the electronic health record through the interface because it's a push only. So that's the reason why we took that decision. Now, if we can go to the next slide, please. As uh, Dr. Batcher was saying, there's a number of different points uh, that, that make taking rapid diagnostics digitalized rather than merely digital uh, improve to provide benefits to the overall system. Uh, and one of these key points is you end up with being able to deliver, improve the deliverability. So this issue of the fact that it's not necessarily being carried out in the way it should be carried out, but improving the deliverability of a test at point of need. So where that result needs to be produced whilst providing central traceability. So centrally using the portal you get traceability clinical governance in, as well as all the metadata so you can see who did the test where the dead test was taken place who the test was done on as well as a piece of genuine raw data showing the actual test itself and the result that was determined by the digital reader and if there was an override result provided by the user what that was as well so being able to pick up those discrepancies and then that direct transfer into the electronic patient record even where lateral flow readers in the in the old bench top box in the corner approach that's been used previously these generate raw data in a much more nebulous way they effectively read it and then print out a till receipt um, out the back of it and this this isn't really raw data any more than someone sitting and writing what they thought the result was whereas with this by having this raw data image there's always a piece of data that can be gone back to to determine whether the result was carried out correctly so you have that piece of raw data always on the server that can go back to. So there's never a clinical decision being made or a patient management decision being made without there being a piece of data there to support why that was taken place. So it gives really good traceability, but it also gives really good protection of clinical staff as well. So what other benefits are there from the point of view using a digital reader? Now, first of all, we need to talk about the bad things. Now, digital readers do make errors. Absolutely, they make errors. Everything makes an error. The question is whether the errors we gain are better than the errors we lose. Now, here's an example of two good um, error cases. So on the left-hand side here, I, we have what we call an artifact. Now, this is a spec, effectively a speck of dirt on the lane. And in this particular case, what's happened is a digital reader, because that spec's in the place that it would expect to see a test band, it's, um, it's actually read it as a positive test. So it's incorrectly read that as a positive test. Now, these are these can be used as training points for our uh, machine learning on our system. So this needn't be this needn't be something that occurs over and over again. So once it's learned from a point, it won't do it again. The second one here is an example of where there was actually a manufacturing error on the lane. So it's a small piece of damage on the lateral flow membrane, and that resulted again in a band uh, in what appeared to the digital reader to be a band. At that point. So um, there's an example of digital reader mistake. So that's how a lot of mistakes that can occur from a, from a user at the moment. So people aren't perfect, we don't expect them to be. And when it comes to human factors, we certainly need to consider that we only employ humans. So we need to do things in such a way that um, is supportive of humans. Now, these are the most common errors that we see um, within lateral flow testing. And the first one is another run sample. I mean, this is a gross example. Uh, but quite often samples are put on the lateral flow that they let them run and as soon as they see a control band they say that test is run and they report results on it now obviously because the um, the reporting color hasn't completely left the gel lane or the lateral flow um, membrane that can include that can hide the presence of a positive test band so you do have an increased chance of false negatives here when you run tests in that way the second example we have there is an example of what we would call, so the first one is left in, in, in human factors and the second one we would call a lapse. And that's an example of where they've left the lateral flow membrane too long. 
So these are 10 minute incubation points. So someone does the test and they go, well, I've got 10 minutes, I'll go off and do the seven other things I've got on my list that to do at the moment. Um, and instead of leaving it for 10 minutes, they end up leaving it for an hour and come back and then reading it. And you can see that, um, hopefully you can see that lateral flow membrane area is completely dried out. Um, so that is, a, is what we call a lap. And that would be a, an increased risk of false positive testing because some test bands do start to show up after a period of time, um, even if they were initially positive. The last example here is a clear mistake where what's happened is a person's gone and instead of loading um, the buffer sample after the swab's been in there, they've actually loaded blood onto that. Now, all of these are things that will not confuse and uh, a digital reader. So not only do we have the system, when it sees this, it can say, this is wrong, it shouldn't happen. Um, so we're not going to provide a result for it. It can also provide a reciprocal relationship with your users for the first time. So what we find is clinical users, it isn't a case that they don't know what they're supposed to do. They absolutely know what they're supposed to do. But at that point in time, they have a priority um, that is something else. And that's the patient that's sitting next to them. And that's absolutely correct for a clinical user that the patient should be the priority. So the priority of the technology is the test. Next test, please. Uh, next slide, please. Now, here's an example of where the technology can be beneficial. Now, this is actually a low positive that was missed by the visual reader. Our technology was able to identify that actually there is a band there. And you can see on the densitometric plot on the right hand side how we pulled that band out to identify a positive uh, <coughs> flu data would have been missed if it had just been left to a visual re reader. So, this is an example of performance improvement or improved sensitivity of the test as a result of using the digital technology. The next slide is very similar with a slight variation. Uh, if we go to the next one. Now, this is an example of what we had earlier. Now, this is an underrun sample. Um, and this is accepting that not everything is perfect. You know, within a clinical setting, people are busy. Their priorities are patients. It is busy. It, it is loud. It is the lighting is not perfect. And sometimes they don't always have the time to apply the attention that they should to the testing. So. As we've improved our technology, we've got better and better at dealing with those user mistakes. And in this, even though this test was underrun, we were actually still able to pull out because our technology has baseline removal from the uh, from the densitometric plotting. We were still able to pull out that low positive. So that's another flu A case that wasn't admitted directly onto a ward where it would have generated a, a risk to patients, or or actually resulted in the ward being frozen up, so they wouldn't have been able to admit it any further. So straight line performance, go to the next slide, please. So I hear you saying it's all very well saying that visual readers um, make mistakes and digital readers make mistakes, but what do they look like? So here's a list of sensitivity versus specificity against a um, expert visual readers of our digital. The first thing I'm gonna do is tell you to ignore the sensitivity and specificity and look over at the error rate side. Now that bottom row there, is the first test that we delivered into Guides and St. Thomas's, and this is the COVID single COVID test. So a simple single lateral flow test. And for that, the, the digital reader had an error rate of 0.6% across thousands of tests that were carried out over the, the lifetime of that particular test in the center. For the user er error rate, the user error rate was 1.37%. Now this is significant in itself because no one's ever been able to say what the error rate of these particular tests are when they're put into the hands of clinical users. Now, I can tell you it started off a lot higher and improved over the course of the time it being delivered because we now had that reciprocality with the user where we could go back and say, you've missed this, this particular test here because you haven't run it for the right amount of time or you've overrun this test, so you've ended up with a false positive result. And rather than just saying you should have done it this way, we were able to show evidence of why it was important that it was kind of carried out that way. So it changed the priority for them um, that running the test correctly would be. But what's really key is when we moved over to doing the multiple tests, so when we look at the uh, dual COVID flu, where we're effectively producing three results from the same cassette, a lot more difficult to read for a visual reader. Our reader error rate at this point had dropped down to 0.35% uh, because obviously we've continued to train our system. The machine learning and computer vision's got better and better as time's gone on. But what seems amazing to me is that the user error rate has dropped significantly as well. So the user error rate at this point is 0.46%. So 
we've seen genuine behavioral change in how people do tests. And this behavioral change is passive. So merely by digitalizing the way in which that rapid diagnostic has been carried out within that care clinical setting, within the emergency department of a busy hospital, we've instituted a behavioral change that's improved the integrity of the results we're generating and therefore the benefits to the patients and the clinical setting. And all of these results, remember, are commutable and can be transferred via the patient record. Now, anyone who knows quality management often sp speaks about the Swiss cheese effect, where the lining up of the holes can mean that a single error can get through multiple layers of checks. But what we have here is a visual reader who's distracted, the mistakes they make are uh, not repeated by the digital reader and the digital reader that might make mistakes, but they're not the same as the mistakes from the visual reader was made. So these combined systems together, although they have inherent error rates, now actually don't have, they, they, they actually support one another because whenever there's this discrepancy between the, the digital reader and the user, um, we can investigate them and find out which is the correct result because we have full traceability of this. System. And uh, that's me done. I'll leave it there. So I think we pass back to Julie now. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you to all our presenters. Um, if anyone has any questions, can they uh, kindly type them in the uh, questions box, please? That's that's the little question mark icon under the chat icon. We don't we don't seem to have any questions, presenters. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I've got a point of discussion if you'd like, Julie, and I think that's yeah. There was something I pulled out from what you were saying, which I thought was really um, key, and that's stakeholder involvement. Um, as someone that used to run a busy blood sciences service and uh, was pathology innovation lead, I fully, fully agree with what you're saying in terms of getting people involved. And I think these sort of, it, it's a matter though, that not everyone has the same um, goal or objective to be pulled out of a particular project, but digitalization of these sort of systems provides a lot of opportunity for engagement on the level that is meaningful to them. Um, so the pathology department, for example, please, please, as someone who comes from pathology, please get pathology involved. They are your experts on tests, but they're likely to want to need to deliver a quality system as well. Um, you know, and if they're moving along the lines of point care accreditation under ISO 22870 as an extension to scope for their 15189. They very they, they need this sort of technology to provide the sort of traceability and lock control that they do. And from an IT perspective as well, um, IT need to deliver at some point uh, paperless across multiple hospital sites, and that's not going to happen while rapid diagnostics are still being done manually. So uh, I think it is a key point to have those stakeholders involved, Julie. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I absolutely agree, and, and it, it is more of a problem in a com when you're rolling out in a community-based setting. Um, it's much more unclear. Right, we have a couple of questions. So, um, what other tests are there in development? Uh, and I'll probably ask the other two as well because it was all related. Um, this technology will this technology be applicable for an HbA1c test? And what about thyroid tests? I mean, I, I, I can answer those, but I I'm, don't want to be the only one talking. <laughs> so, <laughs> I suppose from, from our point of view, what our technology is, is an ecosystem. It's a platform. Um, our technology doesn't care what the test is. So SureScreen is a manufacturer of, um, of uh, tests and we, we partner with them, certainly. But if a, a hospital system, a care system already has a, left, already has a rapid diagnostic, we can apply our, t our technology to that rapid diagnostic. We work independently of the rapid diagnostic, but at the same time allow it to improve its deliver deliverability and performance. From an HbA1c point of view, there are HbA1c rapid diagnostics. Uh, certainly uh, for lateral flow. They tend to be, going back to something else you said in your introduction, it's important they're as good as laboratory tests. Well, in reality, they're not, but it's not always important 
are as good as laboratory tests because a test needs to be fit for purpose. And sometimes what you need to know is, is there some, is there none, or is there a lot? Uh, so if you were managing people for HbA1c and what you wanted to know is whether they were below a management threshold, then you can absolutely do that within a lateral lateral flow. What you couldn't is say exactly what percentage HbA1c or millimole per millimole um, is, is present. But you could say at this threshold, are they above or below it? And that may be from a monitoring point of view, all you need to know. Just to jump in here and, and second what Andrew said uh, from the physical uh, test production side, is yeah ex exactly correct where you can provide semi-quantitative results by having uh, multiple test lines on a single lateral flow strip which will appear at different concentrations of the analyte um, but there aren't currently solutions that will provide yes a fully quantitative um, and you know continuous scale of, of readouts so is exactly correct uh, so we've We've covered HbA1c. Uh, we had particular questions about thyroid, and we've got a new one for creatinine. Yeah, so um, from a physical test production perspective, and, and before we get to the digital side, can we make a lateral flow test for it? Uh, the, the simplest way to look at this is if we can uh, source specific enough antibodies that will give a test with um, suitable specificity and sensitivity, then, then we can use the very same technology that I described to make a test for nominally anything, but it all hinges on um, being able to specifically pick up um, the right molecules. So creatinine is definitely doable. Thyroid test would depend on, on the specifics of what we're, we're looking for, specific biomarkers. Um, but certainly it is the so creatinine's norm cre creatinine's more often test really at point of care using a um, a parameter dip test so a colorimetric dip yeah. rather than lateral flow so it's slightly different testing technology but from a reader point of point of view uh, we do also have technology that reads that as well so we've made a uh, everyone will probably be familiar with 10 parameter dipsticks like this we've made a reader for rot iodine recently uh, to be incorporated on their new point of care meter that will read uh, 10 parameter dipsticks and you know creatinine comes into that as well so we we have actually have a very good point here so um claire comments the capacity for learning from these systems appears fantastic uh, but how can we get other data from patients integrated to help us interpret the impact of risk for example, linked to obesity, asthma, diabetes, to plan next steps in management of the results. So um, I guess it's a question for um, all of our speakers. How do you think you could integrate other data beyond the test result to help make clinical decisions? It's a good question. Um, I think the model we, so our technology that applied in other settings as well so it's been used in clinical trials where um, dip tests or similar rapid diagnostics have been sent out into people's homes to support diagnostics within their home but at the same time because effectively you know it's an app-based system we're able to ask questions as well and that's really valuable from a clinical trial point of view for several reasons first is you're able to ask what Whatever questions you want is fully customizable. But when that data comes into the clinical trial central database, they're able to separate the answers to the questions from the from the test data if they wish to, so that they're not influenced when they're making clinical decisions by one or other route to deter, you know, effectively providing by, uh, blinding, and then they can stitch that data back together at the end. What these systems provide more than data is information. Data is just numbers. You know, it's meaningless, it's without context. This provides you information. So even in terms of the metadata, because we're generating images, if this is out in community settings, you could end up producing a heat map of the spread of an infection across a, across a geography, uh, which is a lot more in interesting than I've had this many negatives and this many positives. You can then for apply resources to those sections, session, uh, to those places, those geographies a lot more intelligently. Um, so spend less money, but actually provide better resource because the resource is tailored to that particular area. But yeah, I mean, it's whatever you can think of, really. <laughs> it's uh, incredibly customizable. I've certainly worked in that space where we've taken the result of a test and also asked the patient to input, for example, PROMS um, or symptoms diaries or symptoms tracking to then add that to the uh, to the biomarker to then look at risk and uh, particularly at the topic today, you know, protection of patients. We've got another couple of questions. We've only got a couple of minutes, so I'll read them both. 
Um, is it likely that cancer biomarkers in blood, for example, methylated DNA, can be identified by such tests? Uh, and then how do I perform interlaboratory comparisons or EQA for blood gas machines, glucose meters? With respect to the, uh, the methylated DNA, we, at the moment, it's unlikely we'll be able to meet the right sensitivity levels to detect these at the moment. Um, off the top of my head, I think there are technological advancements in the, in the works. Um, for example, integrated integrated lamp on CRISPR and things like that. So to build in some of the elements of, of DNA and RNA amplification into a lateral flow test, or similarly, we're working on some other um, really interesting advancements that will improve the sensitivity quite significantly. But I couldn't give you a definite answer yet. It's definitely something that's on the horizon. But uh, so since we've got, would, sorry, people with some, I would say. Sorry, I uh, just just because we're we're reaching time. Just so we can answer the last question, uh, can I ask the people with a, a laboratory background, without your your uh, he, um, company head on, uh, about into laboratory comparisons and EQA for diff so for the, specifically blood gas machines and glucose meters. And Nequas provide those directly, and some. Um... Biorad um, often do EQA schemes as well. This is from a hospital in Vietnam. So Biorad set up external EQA schemes as well, where they can give global comparisons between those particular points. So I'd recommend contacting them like Biorad um, for their EQA schemes. It's probably the best one internationally. Um, in, in the UK, NEQAS is the best, but even if you're in Vietnam, you can actually request historical samples from NEQAS as well, which would allow you to at least take a measure of where your system is from a validation point of view initially before signing up to an EQA scheme. So that's all the questions I have in my panel. So are there any other comments that our speakers would like to make as we're, I think we're about just under a minute away from the session close? I think what I'd like to say is going back to the, the cancer one. Um, what we need to consider is that this breaks the mold on how testing is used at the moment. At the moment, within a clinical setting, there's a requirement that I do one test, make one, make one decision. If you create a system where you can improve the deliverability of diagnostics, where they become more reliable in the hands of lay users or in people that aren't used to doing testing, what you have is a tool to be able to do testing in an entirely different way. Screening within the NHS has a really bad rap. And I can understand why that's the case, because, you know, it, it increases the amount of work you have to do to get a small number of people out. But this technology does that for you. It takes a really big number that you can't cope with and allows you to reduce it to a really small number that you can cope with. So PSA has got a bad rap for prostate cancer screening, for example, because it's extremely sensitive, but it's not very selective. But that's because we rely on a single test carried out on one blood result when someone comes into a care setting. Now. If you could instead provide these screening tools into people's homes and they perform that test themselves uh, on a multiple different um, time points, what you end up with is something that's considerably more mm -hmm. sensitive, but also more selective because you can, you can determine from the delta change in that PSA, whether there's a development of a disease or whether it's benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is something you can't do from a single test, which is all a clinical setting would be able to offer them at the moment. So what, I would say is, you know, you have to put a different head on when you're thinking about um, the, the opportunities and possibilities when you're applying technology in this way. Yeah, I think I'd like to say that too, that uh, don't underestimate the uh, the power that digitalization and these type of tests have on not only improving patient care and reproducibility, but also on the cost savings that you can achieve by replacing more expensive tests with uh, more affordable tests that have digital digital solutions attached. Thank you. I absolutely agree with both of those points. Um, I think we've slightly over time, um, but thank you very much to all of our participants that have been joining this webinar today, and and also thank you very much to all of our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.
Brilliant. Thank you.